The Criminal Case of Jesus Christ versus the United States of America. This could be the most outrageous story that you've never heard. Listen and learn all about the criminal trial of the man who claimed that he was the Son of God. Today, you will finally hear the facts, the truth, the evidence, and the unbelievable outcome of this case. This is one story that you don't want to miss or hear about secondhand. This is the story of a man who came from nowhere. After a careful review of all the information about him, he never once mentioned to anyone exactly where he was from. When asked, he would simply say that his father sent him. Witnesses for the prosecution would later testify that he was born in Hoboken, New Jersey, to an unidentified man and a mother who died from a drug overdose. The story begins on a day in July, when a man named William Smith was shooting video on the beach of Lake Michigan. William just happened to notice and film what appeared to be a man walking on top of the water. It looked like a man was walking on the water to retrieve a toy for a crying child, a toy that had probably been carried out into deeper waters by the waves. William immediately uploaded his video to the internet. Not surprisingly, it went viral. Suddenly, this mystery man was all over the web and people had dubbed him the Water Walker. This would not be the last time that the mysterious man would be captured on video. He was also seen standing on street corners, telling anyone who would listen that they needed to turn away from their sins. Some wondered if he was a preacher of some sort, but if he was, he was an unusual one because he didn't have a soapbox, microphone, or even a megaphone set up. He just stood in one place and spoke quietly to whomever walked past him. He spoke only about saving their souls. In the beginning, few took him seriously, but this was soon to change. One day, he was interviewed by a fame-seeking reporter. At one point in the interview, the reporter asked, Who are you, really? His answer shocked both the reporter and the viewing audiences. In response to the question, he calmly and matter-of-factly said, I am Jesus Christ and I've come to save the world. Many people who watched the video got angry. They were offended that this man who walked the streets of Chicago claimed to be the Son of God. A few days later, another video popped up on the news channels. This new video showed him once again walking on water, but he was not retrieving a child's toy this time. This time, he was rescuing a drowning man. This time, the video wasn't shaky amateur footage. This was recorded by a professional news crew, and it was eyewitnessed by a small crowd of people. This would be the event that would cement his place in the national and global spotlight. The mystery man who called himself Jesus now had all eyes on him. As news crews and people with video cameras began following him around, he became the hottest news and was featured on every channel. The internet created memes of the mysterious Jesus and made countless jokes about him. They called him names like the Water Magician and the Hobo Savior. News stations were curious about his feats so they interviewed famous big-name magicians. They asked how such an illusion could be created. All the magicians gave their plausible, scientific-sounding explanations. They said with the right training, just about anyone could perform such a feat. They assured the listening audiences that it was all just a very basic trick. Jesus was an overnight curiosity and laughingstock. Usually internet sensations rise and fall rather quickly, but not this one. It appeared that Jesus was here and he wasn't going anywhere soon, not just yet anyway. Jesus began visiting the larger churches in the city. He would enter and interrupt the sermons. He'd ask the preachers questions after question about their messages, their riches, and their lifestyles. He openly criticized them and in doing so caused violent outbursts among the church members. 
Some of the church members were arrested for assault on Jesus, while others had to be restrained after threatening to kill the blasphemous heathen, as they called him. Jesus continued to visit different churches and publicly challenged the, their leaders, and as the hostility toward this man grew among the church folk, so did the number of people that followed him. The press also began following him, eager and curious to see what he would do next. Several days passed, and the press decided to interview Jesus. They asked him, Why? Why are you doing this? Why are you here? What's your purpose? He answered them on live TV and said that all he wanted was for mankind to follow him so that they could be saved. In the span of six short days, this man who called himself Jesus Christ had brought division to this great nation. While some found him entertaining and harmless, others considered him dangerous and sacrilegious. Despite what people thought of him, he continued to do amazing things. He visited hospitals where he so-called healed critically ill people. He even appeared to bring a dead man back to life. His traveling show is amazing and very well orchestrated, the newscasters would say. There were also those who were filled with anger that he would dare to call himself the fleshly manifestation of their God. This man slept on park benches at night or in the homes of those who befriended him. Once he was given a fish and a loaf of bread as a joke, but when he broke the bread and divided the fish and generated enough food to feed the massive crowd of curiosity seekers, people got even angrier. The man named Jesus began to grow in popularity. Then suddenly, the media frenzy that surrounded him ceased. He was no longer on the television sets. The radio stations stopped talking about him. It was as if by a single order, they had all stopped sharing the news of this man who calls himself Jesus. Things began to climax around mid-August, a mere 26 days after the first sighting of him. Jesus was arrested by the police. He was charged with statutory rape of a 13-year-old male. Police in riot gear took him into custody as he was preaching to a crowd that numbered a million or more people. The news would later report that Jesus was being charged with several other sexually deviant charges. Several eyewitnesses appeared with so-called evidence against him. His trial made headlines on televisions and newspapers worldwide. The headlines read, The child molesting son of God goes to trial. He was back on every channel, but this time the words he spoke were heavily edited and commented on by religious leaders and politicians. It's as if they were being coached by the same spin doctors. When his trial began, information about his past suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Where once the media could find no information about him, they now painted the picture of a man who had been a lifelong criminal. A man who spent his entire youth in and out of reformatories and prisons. Witnesses came forth one by one and told of seeing him in wild drunken orgies with children. They said that he would often talk about telling the world that he was Jesus when he was high on crack. Numerous witnesses claimed that this man, Jesus, was visiting their homes when these allegations were supposed to have taken place. The prosecution then dug deep into their backgrounds and found dirt in their past to discredit them. Witnesses for Jesus' defense began to dwindle. As some would lose their jobs, others had their homes suddenly foreclosed on, some met with horrible accidents, and there were others who just seemed to disappear completely. Massive crowds gathered outside the court building where this trial was being held. SWAT teams and the National Guard were called out to maintain the peace. The presiding judge eventually ordered the man named Jesus to be gagged and bound whenever he entered the courtroom. He claimed that the man's words incited riots among his followers. The court of public opinion was heavily against this man who called himself Jesus. 
there was a small percentage of people who still supported and believed in his innocence. This would all change as the prosecution dropped their final bombshell. Their latest revelation would all but seal the fate of the man who called himself Jesus. Prosecutors had produced a birth certificate which named this man Harvey Eggleston. They then entered into evidence the remains of a six-year-old girl. They claimed she was repeatedly raped, beaten, mutilated, and finally had her remains partially eaten by the man called Jesus. There were enough witnesses, photographs, and DNA evidence to convict the defendant several times over. When the public heard this news, the crowd of supporters slowly disappeared. Soon it seemed that no one was on the side of the man who called himself Jesus. The newspapers called it the most heinous crime in United States history. There was public outcry for a speedy and harsh execution of this man. This wasn't a man, the prosecutors said. This was a monster who spit in the face of God and all his true believers. Televisions were constantly airing angry politicians, celebrities, and religious leaders calling for Jesus' head on a stick. It turns out that this was not a figurative demand that they were making. At the trial's ending, the jury announced that they needed no deliberation. Jesus was immediately found guilty and sentenced to die. Due to the vile and monstrous nature of his crimes, the judge demanded that his execution be speedy and without mercy in the name of the people. In a short 24 hours, Jesus' life on this earth would be coming to an end. The next day, something very unusual happened. A dirty and obviously beaten Jesus was escorted and marched from his holding cell to the execution chamber, right through the middle of the downtown streets for all the public to see. Angry mobsters lined the streets. They hurled objects at him. Beer bottles, cans, rocks, and sticks pummeled him as he walked. People broke through the police barricades. They ran up to him and kicked and punched him. They punched him hard. They knocked him to the ground again and again. Once after being knocked down and trying to get to his feet, a child ran up to him and spat directly in his face. The crowd roared their approval for the brave child's actions. This man named Jesus, though beaten and bloody, continued to limp forward in accordance with his handler's shouted orders. Strangely enough, Nobody seemed to notice that not once had this man cried out for mercy, nor did he curse his accusers or the violent, angry mob. In fact, his expression only reflected what looked like sadness. Then, without warning, the crowd suddenly parted, and a group of men wearing all black emerged from the opening in the crowd. These large men were carrying a huge wooden cross. Jesus was ordered to halt as the men laid the heavy cross upon his back. As they kicked him and ordered him to carry the cross, the crowd began chanting, Carry your cross, Jesus, carry your cross. And he did. As this procession moved to within one block of the execution house, Jesus' path was suddenly redirected. They were now heading toward Holy Mary Park, which lied directly in front of Cavalry Church of Christ. The rabid crowd arrived at the park cheering as the beaten and bloody man called Jesus stood in the middle of the park which would be his final destination. Then the large men wearing all black took the cross and planted it into the earth and at the direction of more ident unidentified suited men one of the men grabbed Jesus bloody hand and nailed it to the wooden cross. The crowd seemed to be intoxicated by the violence and the hateful energy that filled the air. Jesus' other hand was nailed into place on this death cross. Then finally his feet felt the brutal sting of the spike that would hold them in place. Then the cross was lifted up and the crowd cheered wildly. They were in such a frenzy that fights broke out among them for no apparent reason. They seemed to find a deep, almost spiritual satisfaction in seeing this human being badly beaten and completely covered in his own blood. 
The pandemonium was punctuated by their witnessing of the clown Jesus being crucified in front of the church that he recently visited and tried to convince the leaders and followers to turn away from their sinful ways. Some people in the crowd laughed while others continued to pelt him with whatever objects they could find, including shoes. And still others simply yelled and screamed. The noise was deafening. One could hardly hear the sounds of the helicopters that circled overhead. They were there to provide live coverage of this event to news stations worldwide. This was indeed a joyous occasion for the people. And then something happened that caught everyone off guard. Though Jesus had truly endured a vicious no holds barred attack today, a non-distinct man from the crowd ran up and rammed a pole or spear into his side. This man, who called himself Jesus, who claimed that he only wanted to save the world, winced in pain. People in the crowd stared with their mouths agape as they watched what appeared to be water flowing from the wound. People in the crowd wore confused expressions. Maybe they thought their eyes were simply playing tricks on them. Maybe they believed this to be the final trick for this pretender magician. One can only wonder about the various thoughts in the minds of that vast crowd. But one would only have a brief moment to wonder, because the skies quickly began to darken. And with this change of the daytime skies, so too did the looks on the faces of the once ravenous crowd. Next came a rapidly forming storm, a storm of intense magnitude and power. The winds of this storm howled, bending trees and pushing smaller members of the crowd off their feet. Then came the rains, which fell in drops so large that they caused pain upon impact with the now fleeing crowd. This storm of storms reached violent and dangerous levels in under a minute's time. The crowd barely had a chance to move from their places when the earth itself started to shake. It began with a tremble, which caused mass screams of fearful terror within the once angry crowd. Within seconds, the tremble had intensified into an angry shaking of the earth that caused buildings to crack at their foundations. Openings in the earth appeared, swallowing many of the onlookers. Those fortunate enough to make it back to their homes closed their doors and immediately fell to their knees and prayed. They prayed for protection. They prayed for their family's safety. They prayed for forgiveness yet again. The question on the lips of those who have read this story is what kind of people would commit such a vile act? And what kind of God would forgive it?